First, you should see a slide on your screen with the title of today's webinar. And if you don't or if you have any problems today during the webinar, please hang up and dial Start Meeting's toll-free support line. That number is 1-800-644-9070. It's listed on the screen at the moment. And I'll say it one more time, 1-800-644-9070. Because we're recording and to ensure good sound quality, eliminate background noise, we have muted all the phone lines. So you can hear us, but we can't hear you. We do want you to ask questions throughout, and the way to do that is by using the chat box on the left um, side of the screen. You can choose to have your question seen by just the presenter or by all participants. So if you select moderator, it will just go to the moderator. Uh, chat us your questions at any point along the way, and there will also be time at the end of the webinar for questions as well. And then we will send a follow-up email after the webinar with a link to the recording and um, so forth. So that takes care of housekeeping. If you happen to be new to the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, just a brief um, bit on what we do. We support individual nonprofits and the sector at large to be their own voice in the public policy process. And we do that by providing, by providing training on advocacy and lobbying. We serve as a resource to policymakers on the sector, and we advocate ourselves on issues that impact the sector at large you know, incentives for charitable giving, nonprofit tax exemptions, lobbying rights, and so forth. Next month in our webinar series, our topic will be civic engagement and local elections. So we hope you'll tune in for, for that on July 31st. And then in August, we'll be looking at building a grassroots strategy. All the previous ones that you see grayed out, we, we have already completed and we have online archived at our YouTube page. So you can um, check that out anytime, and we hope you'll join us for the full rest of the series. We will be joined today by Christina Wessel, who is the de Deputy Director of the Minnesota Budget Project. I'll say more about the Budget Project in just a minute. And Jeannie Fox, our Deputy Public Policy Director here at MCN. If you're new to the Minnesota Budget Project, that's an initiative of MCN. And their mission is to provide research, analysis, and advocacy on tax and budget issues, really looking particularly at how those policies impact low and moderate income families and other vulnerable populations. So as we talk about um, kind of the content of what happened at the session, um, know that year in and year out, the budget project is really a great go-to resource for understanding all things related to the state budget and really looking again through that lens that I think is important to so many of the nonprofits as to how it impacts low and moderate income families. So with that, uh, we'll go over our learning objectives and we're going to hand things over to Jeannie Fox. Jeannie. Thank you, Jeff, and good morning. Welcome everyone for joining in our conversation here. Um, as you see from your slide, we're going to first do just some basic context setting um, for people who are on the call who don't spend a lot of time at the Capitol and don't want to spend a lot of time at the Capitol, um, that's our job and we're your eyes and ears for you. So we'll talk a little bit about just kind of what was the political landscape and what was the calendar and the timeline for the decisions that were being discussed. And then, um, especially with Christina, then we will drill down into the weeds a bit on some specific high profile issues and what most of the debate concerned around. So if we look at the agenda there, we're going to start out with uh, some of the biggies, the tax and budget issues. Christina will go in depth on the health care reform as well. Um, I'm going to share some specifics related to what were the things being talked about at the Capitol that would have affected all nonprofits, whether you're an environmental group or an arts group or a human services group. And Jeff will talk about elections and democracy and the marriage equality bill. That's how we'll plan to spend the rest of the next hour there. So if you read the papers at all, even if you're not at the Capitol, you probably noticed everybody was talking about the budget all the time. And the main reason that is is because in Minnesota, the state budget is set on a two-year cycle called a biennium. And that is always done in the odd numbered years. So really the main item of business for the legislature this session was to set a state budget. If you have been in Minnesota for a while, you may recall both in 2005 and 2011, we experienced government shutdowns 
because the legislature and the governors at the time were not able to come to agreement on a budget. We knew we wouldn't see that scenario repeat itself right now, um, but certainly budget talks dominated the session. And we'll, we'll go into some very specifics on where things ended up. But just to remind you, when we walked in in January, there was a shortfall projected. The legislature, with the governor's help, um, did take care of that and made some other structural changes moving forward. So those are going to be some of our main topics in just a little bit here. So who gets to decide <laughs> is the question. And mostly, remember, we live in a representative democracy. So the state is divided into 67 Senate districts. That's based on population. Those lines, you may recall, were just redrawn uh, recently following the 2010 census. And each Senate district is divided into two halves, and that's your A and B half for the House of Representatives. So there's twice as many members of the House. And then, of course, we have one governor and other constitutional office, offices. But in this process, particularly in regard to the budget, the governor kind of lays down the first gauntlet and introduced a budget of his priorities early on in the session. And then the rest of the months following is the legislature basically responding to that and coming up with their own ideas um, and, and then working out those differences. That process cannot be done without people like you on the phone and organizations like MCN and other advocacy organizations that want to make sure people with expertise bring that knowledge, that experience, those stories to the Capitol. Um, particularly in a budget year where legislators will see spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet of numbers. Um, I think it is possible that they can forget these are real life human beings who are impacted by these decisions. So that's part of our job is to put a human face on these um, numbers. What does it mean for real people? What would be lost? What would be gained? Um, so certainly many nonprofits were there making the case. If you're not um, yeah, if you're not camped out at the Capitol, a great way to stay in touch is to use the legislature's website. It's award-winning, it's very user-friendly, um, very comprehensive. So you just go to ledge.min, and then there's a House page, there's a Senate page, there is joint commissions, there's the legislative reference library, many, many, many resources that exist to help you stay connected. It's very accessible. You can track bills by subject matter, by author, um, any number of ways to kind of keep your fingers on what's, what's happening and what's being discussed. And in some ways, the use of technology, you can get things quicker online sometimes than if you're out in the hallway when it comes to amendments and, and other pieces of paper and documents. So I think we're going to jump right into the meat of things here because we want to leave time for questions. And certainly, don't wait. Um, please send in your questions via the chat while we're talking because that way Christina or I or whoever is um, talking can, can explain um, something you might have a question about while we're on that topic. But Christina, let me turn it over to you. We had a very different situation here now following the 2012 election where the governor, the leaders of the House and Senate were all of the same party. But as I observed, that does not mean they always get along or have the same ideas about how to get from here to there. But can you kind of talk about um, what were some of the big changes and uh, explain to us what's in this final budget? Sure. Thanks, Jeannie. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this call. And Hopefully we can get you briefed at least on some of the major things that happened during uh, the last legislative session. Um, one of the major issues of the session that occupied a lot of time was a question of whether we will raise revenues. Uh, Governor Dayton had made this a top priority, uh, not only just this legislative session, but also since he took office. It's been a big priority for him to try to raise revenues here in the state. And with the last election and the Democrats controlling both the House and the Senate, that kind of gave us the trifecta we needed to finally make it happen in the state. And quite frankly, it's been long overdue. Uh, there's been a real need to raise revenues to have the ability to invest and rebuild our state after many years of deficits and budget cuts. 
and also a need to rebalance the state tax system to make it more fair. Over the years, it's become increasingly regressive as we've cut progressive taxes and raised regressive taxes. And so we've really reached a point where lower income people in our state are paying a higher percentage of their income than the higher income earners. And there was a real desire to address that problem in our state. So the end result was that they raised a net $1.7 billion in taxes. The biggest ticket item was a new income tax bracket for the wealthiest 2% of Minnesotans. So for example, a couple um, will pay 9.85% on income over $250,000. So that's the new tax bracket that was added only for those very top income earners. Then another big ticket item was to increase the tobacco tax by $1.60 per pack, and I believe that takes effect on July 1st, so on Monday. And there was also um, some big changes to corporate tax preferences. There was a desire to kind of close some loopholes and remove some of the benefits from multinational corporations, and that results in more revenue for Minnesota and fewer tax breaks for some of those big corporations. Another big change that you'll probably notice in your own life is uh, there was a move to modernize the state uh, sales tax. This is kind of long overdue. Uh, technology has been changing and the state sales tax hasn't been keeping up with it. So there will now be um, more uh, collecting of taxes from internet retailers, like um, it's kind of like an Amazon kind of tax. There's also taxing some digital goods, like eBooks, music, and movies will now be taxed. And um, there's going to be some changes to how we tax things like cables and other kinds of television services. We're not done equally, so we're changing that. Um, but it wasn't just raising taxes. There's also some tax breaks and some additional money that was spent in the tax bill. A big thing is to there was a desire to reduce pressures on property taxes and local governments in two ways. One is by increasing property tax refunds for homeowners and renters by $135 million. And there's also additional $172 million in local government aid to help fund local services. So, And Christina, we have one question at the outset, and I think we'll get into a lot of this as we go. But just generally speaking, what do you think are some of the outcomes that are expected with the additional revenues that have been passed into law? What, is, what does this mean? Well, actually, that's the very next thing we're going to talk about is how they choose to, chose to spend the money that they raised. I mean, part of it went to solving the budget deficit. As Jeannie mentioned, there was a $1.1 billion deficit, so resources were needed to fill that hole. But the remaining resources were kind of divided out among all the budget areas to make some really critical investments that will be essential for getting our state back on track for the long term. We know that Minnesota doesn't have, um, people aren't necessarily attracted here for the same reasons they're attracted to places like California and Florida. So our greatest asset in the past has been a really strong, highly educated workforce. And that's really what's been able to drive our economy in the past. But in order for that to be true in the future, we really needed to be investing in a lot of critical areas to make sure we have the workforce we need in the future. And so as I talk here, you'll see that that's kind of where they really focused a lot of their efforts. So let's start by looking at uh, E-12 education. There was $485 million of those resources went into E-12 education. Um, a big part of it was to increase the general education formula to give school districts some extra money to cover classes in the classroom. There was also a move to fund um, optional all-day kindergarten for every school in the state. So every student will have the opportunity to go to all-day kindergarten if they choose. There's also $40 million for early learning scholarships, and this will help thousands of really high-need students age three to five access some critical early childhood education that gets them on the right track for their entire school career. Now, um, you may have heard about the school funding shift issue. Um, there was a desire by some to completely repay the schools the money that they were owed from borrowing we did for them in the past. But in the end, they chose not to make any additional investments in that up front. So the state still owes school districts $808 million. Um, however, we will continue to pay back the shift the way that we have been, which is every time the state sees a, a positive balance or surplus um, over the coming months and years, any of that money that shows up in the state's budget will actually go to paying back the school funding shift until it's fully paid back. Um, higher education is also absolutely critical for having a very strong uh, workforce in the future, and they made efforts to improve access to education by making it more affordable for students. So there's $47 million in invested in student financial aid through the state grant program. 
Um, and there was also some additional kinds of financial aid, uh, such as an American Indian scholarship that's fully funded, and a summer bridge program that's there to help students transitioning from high school into college so that they can succeed in that new environment. Another big move was to provide additional resources to the University of Minnesota and Minsky to allow them to freeze tuition at current academic year levels for the next two years. In addition to that, there was also some extra funds to help retain kind of the best faculty that they have, as well as to start investing in some emerging fields so that um, our universities and colleges can kind of be at the forefront of what's coming in the future. Um, housing, really key. A healthy economy depends not only on, uh, depends on a strong workforce, but that workforce needs education, they need specialized training, and they need stable and affordable housing. Otherwise, they can't be where the jobs are. So there were a number of investments in housing, including building new affordable housing, as well as rehabilitating existing housing. And there's things like rental assistance to help people, including students and individuals with mental illness, obtain affordable housing so that they can kind of be uh, where they need to be to get the education or go to the jobs that they need to. And in economic development in general, um, there was about $54 million of loans and grants to Minnesota businesses with the goal of creating 12,500 to 15,000 new jobs in the state. And there's additional grants for business development and workforce training, as well as job training for at-risk youth, um, assistance and assistance for those with mental and physical disabilities to get the job training they need to succeed. And businesses are also going to benefit from a reduction in their unemployment insurance tax rate, which means they'll have a little bit more dollars to spend on other things. Um, that's, that's areas where we saw some very clear large investments being made. Um, Health and Human Services was a little trickier. They actually had what's called a negative target, where uh, the Health and Human Services Committee was required to cut $50 million from their budget. Um, but in the end, they actually found a lot of alternative resources uh, to actually create, make some really uh, significant investments in health and human services. So they turned to um, getting some funding from um, HMOs and managed care organizations, as well as from uh, the state's other fund, the Health Care Access Fund. And with those resources, they were able to make a lot of uh, really key investments. So for example, in mental health, uh, there's um, increases in school-linked mental health services, better care coordination for individuals that have mental health issues, additional mobile um, mental health crisis teams to respond to situations that arise, and additional suicide prevention services. In childcare, they were able to restore the number of excused absences back up to 25 days, and that gives families a lot more flexibility to deal with schedules without jeopardizing their childcare assistance. So if a parent's sick and can't bring the child to child care, uh, they aren't necessarily penalized for things like that. And there's also additional money to improve payment rates for child care providers. And in fact, there's payment rate increases for others as well, including medical assistance providers, providers nursing facilities, and home and community-based services. So all of these kind of provider rate increases are meant not only to help the providers, but also to make uh, these services more accessible for lower income people by making um, it more feasible for these providers to serve these pe this population. Uh, there's also an increase uh, investment in the statewide health improvement program, and this supports local efforts to improve community health through prevention efforts. Uh, there's also additional resources to reduce homelessness, including supportive services, uh, transitional housing, emergency services and outreach grants, and some of the funds are targeted specifically at homeless, um, homeless youth, which is a serious problem in our state. There's a few other uh, good steps that were taken, like repealing the family cap in the Minnesota Family Investment Program. And this prevents families from receiving additional assistance when a child is born. Um, so that cap will be eliminated, so families will continue to get, will get additional funds if they have additional children although the implementation of that is delayed until January 1st of 2015, so there'll be um, some time before there's relief in that area. And there's a lot of other things that happen, like increases in food shelf program funding and the state reinstated state funding for FAME, um, which is, uh, helps low-income families build assets for uh, either obtaining post-secondary education, purchasing a home, or starting a business. So those are all some real important steps that were taken in healthcare. Christina, I know we're going to be quickly moving into healthcare reform, so let me throw out a question that's come in um, more related to the budget in general, and probably more specifically in education. But we know despite 
Minnesota's strong standing in a lot of areas, uh, including education, there are a lot of disparities, and particularly with kids of color. Um, any conversation that you're aware of, any, any outcomes in this new budget that may help reduce some of those inequities? I think, yes, some of the funds are directed in uh, the K-12 education program to districts often based mo more on income as a proxy, I think, for communities of color, but um, to help deal with some of the inequities in education, educational funding. And I think a lot of the resources, like the early childhood grants, are also intended to help um, overcome those kind of disparities we are seeing in communities of color. Um, we also see some of that um, in healthcare as well. We know there's significant healthcare um, inequities and outcomes. And so kind of the stuff I'm going to be talking about in a moment, we hope will increase insurance rates among all populations, including communities of color, and ultimately lead to better healthcare outcomes. Although I have to say, you know, everything we take is hopefully a step in the right direction, but there's still uh, significantly more that needs to be done. And I think it's, um, it's always critical that we continue to call attention to these issues and call for more resources to address these kinds of problems. So. Um, so, great, let's jump right in. Here's, here's a little example there of legislative language on your page. What is this Affordable Care Act, yeah, Christina? Well, <laughs> you know, there were a lot of critical issues capturing the attention of legislators during the one session, um, but one really, really huge issue that I don't know everybody really understood was going on was how Minnesota was going to act to implement the Affordable Care Act in our state. Now, this federal law was packed, passed back in 2010, and it's kind of been in the background for a number of years now, uh, but the deadline is almost here. January 1st, 2014 is when the bulk of the Affordable Care Act is going to take place. And even though it's a federal law, a lot of the decisions about how to implement the Affordable Care Act and what will mean were left up to states to decide. And so it was time, this was our last chance for Minnesota to actually take action and figure out how we wanted to do this. And we did take some really huge steps forward this session and made some choices that we hope will create some huge for improvements for families in our state. So um, there's kind of three uh, components of what happened this session. The first step was to create a health insurance exchange here in Minnesota. And this is called Minsure. And it's an online competitive marketplace where individuals and small businesses will be able to shop for health care insurance. And it's expected that more than 1 million Minnesotans will be enrolling in public and private insurance through Minsure in the next few years. And all of this is going to be changing very soon. Um, open enrollment begins October 1st. That means people can start looking for and shopping for insurance October 1st. And their coverage will begin January 1st. So that's only just a few months away from now. And this is a really critical opportunity uh, for low and moderate income Minnesotans to qualify for subsidies to make more insurance more affordable to them. And these subsidies are only available if they enroll in insurance through Minsure, through this health insurance exchange. And some of the key elements to understand about it is that Minnesota had a choice as to whether or not to create an exchange of our own or to go with a federal exchange. And because we are a leader in health care reform and have had many, so many advancements already, uh, we really chose to go with a state exchange so that we could keep those improvements uh, intact in our state and continue to be a leader in health care reform. And Minsure is actually kind of set up as a state agency, but it's, it is independent to some degree and has its own seven-member board that will direct its operations. So that's Minsure, which we're going to be hearing a lot more about um, in the coming days and could talk a lot more about it, but we're going to limit the scope here today. Um, another critical element of what happened during the legislative session was expanding medical assistance. And perhaps you've heard a lot of uh, discussion about this out um, kind of in the newspapers and in the news. Um, but when the Affordable Care Act was originally passed, one of the elements of it was to require all states to expand medical assistance, also known as Medicaid, um, up to 138% of poverty so that it would cover basically all adults all children, everybody, up to 138% of poverty, which is much higher than mo most states have, including our own state. Unfortunately, uh, when the Supreme Court decision upheld the Affordable Care Act, it struck down this requirement. And so after, as, as of that point, it was up to states to decide whether or not to expand Medicaid. And fortunately, Minnesota was one of the states that did it. And why this is important is that medical assistance is a very, very 
meaningful, valuable program for very low-income individuals. There are no premiums, and there are very low out-of-pocket costs for individuals, and it has a very broad benefit set that enables people who have real health care conditions, whether it's mental health issues or physical issues, um, to get the, the care that they need to be healthy and to be productive. Um, there were some big steps we took in 2014, or in the 2013 legislative session, and these, step, these things will take effect in 2014. But as I said, we did expand eligibility up to 138% of poverty like the federal government uh, asks states to do. And incidentally, all the people who are newly eligible for the program, the federal government will cover 100% of those costs for the first few years. So there really was no cost to the state to make that choice for those people. They've also eliminated asset tests. And if you're familiar with the program, um, you know that asset test can be quite a limitation for some individuals who are trying to build up assets so that they can um, improve their financial situation and move out of poverty. And it also complicates the application process. So by removing asset tests, it really simplifies it, uh, the process and makes more people eligible. And there's also a lot of improvements to the enrollment and renewal process. We lost a lot of people because they um, weren't able, they, they made some little form error, they didn't get the right paperwork in, or they forgot to do whatever, and they either lost coverage or they were unable to enroll. And so by simplifying that, we'll get a lot more people who need to get health insurance actually get health insurance. And this is now going to be start covering, as of January 1st, it will cover all adults between 19 and 65 years of age, from 0 to 138 percent of the federal poverty level. So you can see kind of on the slide there what incomes that equates to. Also, for children up to age 18 and pregnant women, um, it will cover these individuals all the way up to 275% of poverty, so a much higher income level. So um, that really gives a good safe haven for our kids um, and pregnant women as well. And the third kind of component of what happened here um, in Minnesota was preserving Minnesota care. Um, Minnesota CARE has been around for about 20 years, and it's really a unique program in the United States. And it's there to help um, kind of low to middle income families who cannot get access to health insurance through their employer, maybe because their employer doesn't offer it, or they're self-employed, or they're a farmer, or there's some individual who just can't get health insurance any other way, and found that the private market was far too expensive for them. So Minnesota CARE provides um, health insurance for those people. It has, they pay premiums, but they're reduced and cost less than they would pay in the private market. It has pretty low out-of-pocket costs, similar to med medical assistance, and also has a very broad benefit set. So it's not only affordable for people, but it's also meaningful health insurance that will actually help them uh, meet their needs if they, if they have any kind of health care issues. There were some improvements made to Minnesota Care in the 2013 session, so starting on January 1st, there were some limits on hospital coverage for adults, and those will be removed. They've also removed a lot of waiting periods that were there. Um, it took several months for people after they lost other health insurance to even qualify for Minnesota Care. Well, those kind of waiting periods are gone. They are also able to reduce premiums by 10 to 50 percent for individuals, and um, changed how the eligibility will work for people. So, Minnesota Care adults between 19 and 65 years of age. Like I said, they're eligible for Medicaid up to 138%, and at that point, then they will become eligible for Minnesota Care from 139 to 200% of poverty. Um, additionally, lawfully present immigrants um, are often not eligible for medical assistance, even if they're very low income for their first five years. Fortunately, Minnesota Care will cover those individuals from zero to 200% of poverty, so they will also be able to access affordable health insurance. So all of these um, are really critical steps in healthcare reform that really kind of create a continuum of affordable healthcare for our families um, as they're moving from poverty, hopefully, into to self-sufficiency to a point where they can either get insurance through their employer or can purchase insurance on their own through the private market. And Christina, these decisions um, clearly will provide many opportunities for the individuals that many nonprofits serve but it seems also some opportunities for nonprofits themselves. And I'm thinking maybe about like the role of navigators. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about other ways nonprofits might be serving these newly eligible clients? Absolutely. Um, the Affordable Care Act envisioned a really key role, I think, for community-based organizations to make sure people are getting health insurance. As of January 1st, everyone's going to be required to have health insurance, or at least almost everybody will be required. And now, and that was 
And part of that was creating all these options for people to enroll. So now we need to make sure the people who need to get insurance are actually able to find and enroll in the options that are available to them. And so that's why there's been created this role of navigator or also in-person assister. And these people are, um, like I said, people working in community-based organizations or in the county or in hospitals or could also be brokers and agents, but their role is to find the people who need health insurance and help them enroll in the product, into health insurance that, that meets their needs. There is uh, funding available for organizations, community-based organizations that want to act in this role. Um, so they can get a stipend that kind of pays them per enrollee. There's also some larger grants that can help um, build the infrastructure an organization may need to be able to play this role, like buying computers or hiring staff. And there's also funds uh, to help with outreach because we know um, we have a pretty low uninsurance rate here in the state, um, but there's a lot of key people who have not been enrolling. And I think this is another area we see where communities of color, immigrant communities, and others are not accessing insurance in the way uh, that we hoped that they would. And so these outreach grants are really intended to help bring people in, uh, you know, reach out to them, get them in, get them enrolled, and help them get the health insurance that they need. So um, we've got a lot of other, there's a lot of information on this as well. On our, on our YouTube site is a, um, a webinar that we did a couple weeks ago with Minsure that if you're interested in perhaps per playing this role as a navigator in person assister, really goes through the details of how you would apply for that grant and answers a lot of questions people may have about how to go through that process. Great. We encourage you to go back and find that, um, particularly that grant information. Before we move on, let's go back to a question that came in more about the, um, the budget, less about health care reform. And we, we talked in some detail about the negative target in the health and human services area. And my impression is um, part of how that was dealt with was creating some very targeted um, priorities for certain populations, mm -hmm. um, use of health care access fund, use of federal dollars in a way that was expanded, but also um, bringing in some revenues from providers. And some of those providers are nonprofit providers. Can you explain a little bit what the trade-off is there, Christina? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we initially saw some much worse suggestions for how to get resources to help kind of balance the the issues that they were dealing with. Um, there were, in the end, um, about $76 million are raised by changing kind of how the surcharge, there's a surcharge that's paid right now, it's kind of technical, um, but that hospitals and HMOs have to pay. Um, and so they've kind of, you know, a lot of these changes happen at the last minute. The one way I described it is, is being explained is like they shifted how these payments are made. So uh, we're kind of getting more money up front from these payments than, uh, Rather than an increase, it's kind of a change in how that pays. Now, of course, like with the school funding shift, that has implications for pr providers. No matter how they choose to phrase it, um, it means at some point someone's paying more than they expect it to. Um, but um, I would say um, that, well, there's also the um, same thing with the surcharge. There's on intermediate care facilities for developmentally disabled as well. So there are some providers that are hit by the surcharge. Um, the goal is ultimately that, you know, federal funds kind of compensate for that, but it doesn't always mean that everybody's compensated the same way, so there always tends to be winners and losers whenever they use this tactic. So, yes, it's unfortunate that in the end they had to, con they chose to continue to use this way of raising revenues, um, but it's also unfortunate that leadership gave them, a, you know, a negative target. If we had been able to avoid that target um, and actually maybe have flat funding or, you know, an, a small increase in health and human services, then they wouldn't have necessarily resorted to some of those options. So um, it's disappointing, to say the least. Well, and we are going to talk at the end before we hang up about unfinished business and what happens in the second year of the biennium. So hold that thought, and we're going to come back to that. I'm going to move us into a couple different areas that are maybe a little less sexy in a way that the health and human services work I know is near and dear to the hearts of many of our members and the passion of the missions of many of the organizations. But we're going to talk a couple about a couple other areas that the Council of Nonprofits cares about on behalf of our members that we want to make sure you have information on. So we're going to talk about two items specifically that would have affected nonprofits of all stripes. And this is under the keeping the world safe for nonprofits work that we do at the Capitol. 
what are things that would infect the entire sector regardless of your issue area. So two areas where we mobilized our members um, in, in great detail and I'd say to great effect um, are related to, first of all, the charitable deduction. Now this is a, an individual benefit. Um, people that give money to your organization uh, get to deduct uh, an amount of that that has a tax benefit for them. Ann Lancheski, the House Taxes Chair, proposed that that deduction be eliminated and replaced with a credit. And so it's a little bit different mechanisms. Uh, the Council on Nonprofits, the Council on Foundations, the United Way, and other infrastructure groups express concern about that change. Um, it's a conversation we think is worth having. And um, there are pieces of that that could have some real benefits. For example, it treated itemizers and non-itemizers, how people fill out their tax forms. It treated them the same. Um, but it also set a floor, a threshold of giving at which people would have to give in order to receive the benefit. And our overall concern is that this might, in fact, be a disincentive to giving, and especially to smaller amount givers, and we do care about them. So we worked hard to say, hang on, let's talk about this over the interim, let's explore some of these different tax mechanisms and benefits. This is a conversation happening at the national level as well, um, but we thought this proposal came up a little too fast with not enough work behind it. So as it was proposed, we, we opposed it um, greatly. So. What happened toward the end of session is it was included in the House tax bill, but never the Senate version. And the Senate tax leadership um, also shared many of the same concerns. So that piece was taken out in conference committee and didn't advance. We are certain that it will be discussed again next session in the second year of the biennium. So more to come on that. And like I said, this is, this is part of the national conversation as well, not just in Minnesota. So we are working with the National Council of Nonprofits, independent sector, and other DC-based uh, organizations around these and similar issues. You may recall even President Obama has proposed at times capping the tax deduction benefit. So that's, that's a big topic for our sector. MCN will continue to keep an eye on that for you. The other one uh, was related to what we are seeing as a proliferation of fees, and I say that with quotations around it, um, that local government cities in particular have been enacting, I'd say over the last three or so years. Um, many of you have ex expressed current concerns to us from your particular cities about something like street lighting fees being passed by the city council and showing up on your utility bill. So this is you know, something that has been a basic function of government and it's now moved out of the general fund for the city, set up in its own fund and called a fee and then they can charge it to all property owners including those who are tax exempt. So you can imagine um, probably the biggest thing MCN gets worried about is when we feel our tax exemptions on property, income, sales, when those are threatened. Um, they're there for a reason, and that's the case we needed to make at the Capitol. So what a bill that the League of Cities proposed this session would have been way beyond anything we've seen at the local level, such as street lighting. It uh, would have allowed cities to create what they call street improvement districts that would have covered anything from curb and gutter, you know, to um, retaining walls, roads, lights, et cetera. Very broad. Um, it also bypassed the benefits test that is required for special assessments, which nonprofits do pay um, and always have paid, and we don't argue that because in a special assessment, benefit to the property is, is demonstrated and um, that actually helps the property owner in the long run. So we opposed this bill with a very strange, uh, for us, host of bedfellows. Um, we were in the most diverse coalition that MCN has ever been involved with. It included other uh, entities such as the Minnesota Association of Realtors, the auto dealers, the bankers, the Chamber of Commerce, 
and then many um, other nonprofit partners that we brought to the table, the Girl Scouts, um, the Private College Council, and the YMCAs and others. So this bill existed in a couple different places, both in the House and the Senate, and the short version is during that process, we were able to obtain an exemption for nonprofits, at least uh, in the Senate version for charities, uh, which most of you would fall under that definition, and in the House version, any nonprofit, which also included churches, universities, public burying grounds, et cetera. Um, so had the bill passed, there was some protection there for nonprofits, but we did stay in the coalition to the very end and again, this is another example of something that didn't make it through conference committee. It is a high priority for the cities, and we understand why. And we know that next to health and human services, over the past decade, the brunt of budget cuts made at the state level went to local governments, both cities and counties. Some of that was remedied this year. Um, we saw an increase in local government aid to cities and county aid to counties. Uh, cities were able to obtain sales tax exemption, something that it, they'd enjoyed in the past and had been done away with. So we hope some of those things will alleviate the need to come up with these more creative fees, which, of course, we see as a tax by another name as it relates to tax-exempt property. Um, but we do expect this to also be part of the conversation when the legislature comes back in February of 2014. So neither of those items advanced, and uh, we spoke out strongly on behalf of the non nonprofit sector on both. Um, if you're listening to the national news today, you know that elections and voting rights is a very big topic today. We have a Supreme Court decision yesterday um, that drastically changed something in the Federal Voting Rights Act. I'm going to ask Jeff to talk just a little bit about some items that were under consideration this year related to voting and election reform. Yeah, absolutely. So we at MCN monitor pretty closely what goes on uh, with voting and kind of democracy in general. One of our theories of change, uh, is, you know, as you all are doing this work, is that it's essential that people are involved with decisions that affect them directly and, and certainly voting is one way to be involved with that and we also know that the policy process um, suffers when the, the kind of the electoral process is disconnected from the community. So we're always looking for um, encouraging voter participation and having a strong system that facilitates that. Um, you know, it was only seven, about seven months ago that we had um, a really important question on the ballot um, the, the voter restriction amendment was defeated. And so we kind of came into this session not knowing, you know, before November, if there would be an implementation um, work to be done on that, should it have passed, or other challenges to it, or, um, or what the makeup would be. So um, as it turns out, that, that amendment was, was soundly defeated, and we ended up with a um, DFL-controlled House, Senate, and Governor. You may recall, however, that Governor Dayton has set kind of a bipartisan requirement for election law. Um, he hasn't said, you know, how many Republicans would have to join for it to be considered bipartisan, but basically he said, I'm going to veto legislation, including the voter ID bill, the statutory bill that he vetoed, unless it has broad bipartisan support. So that was some of the context for looking at what could be done around elections and democracy, and that was one of the areas that um, the Republicans could really – have a lot of control over because with the kinds of the exceptions of bonding, which also requires bipartisan support because of the numbers, and this this was one issue that they could really have a lot of influence. So we we didn't see a whole lot of activity in the end. Um, there were a number of provisions that made it through the process but didn't earn bipartisan support. But let me run through two that did go through, and then talk about two that didn't. So they passed the um, what's known as the no excuse absentee balloting policy. So whereas previously, if you wanted to, to mail in an absentee ballot, you had to have a reason why, you know, you were uh, ill, you were going to be out of the district. Um, there were a couple other reasons. Now, anybody who wants to, to use an absentee ballot can do so without providing an excuse. So we really um, are, are pleased with that result. We think they're um, 
you know, if, if somebody wants to vote absentee, they should be able to. And um, that will be a change starting in 2014. So that won't apply to the, any municipal elections this year. Um, we did see kind of a, a movement uh, toward restriction in vouching. So they reduced the number of persons a registered voter may, may vouch for. This is citizen to citizen vouching. So what this means is, um, whereas before, a citizen could bring you know, up to 15 neighbors or people that live in their building, now they'll only be able to vouch for eight others. So that's uh, a restricting of that policy. I really want to emphasize that this doesn't impact the, um, the facilities that, that have, you know, if you run a shelter, uh, a group home, other of those kinds of facilities, uh, there's still unlimited vouching that employees of those facilities can do. So this only applies for citizen-to-citizen -citizen relationships and not if you are a staff at a shelter. You can still vouch for everybody there. So we're, we're very pleased that that remains intact. Um, two things that they didn't address. Uh, so we have been involved with the Voting Rights Coalition at MCN working to enact a, an early voting system where people could go in and, and cast a ballot at, at, at a voting center. And um, that was did not succeed, did not get any bipartisan support. Um, and so that failed. And then there was actually, in the end, no action taken to address voting rights uh, issues and problems around those who've had a felony conviction in the past. So um, some of the context there is there's a lot of lack of clarity uh, among people in that situation as to what their rights are because it varies very much by state. And the state doesn't currently have any process that's unified or consistent to notify people when their rights have been taken away and when they're, when they're restored. So what you see are people not voting when they should, when they are allowed to, and you also see people voting when they're not allowed to um, because they, they, you know, they don't have clarity on what their status is. So there were two proposals. One was to, to create a system to notify people of their situation. Another was to actually restore the right to vote upon release from incarceration, which is uh, a policy that we very much favor and believe that if you've served your time and you're paying taxes and you're trying to reintegrate into the community, that um, being involved with democracy is actually a positive. It's a pro-social behavior that we think would benefit um, everybody. So uh, in the end, um, neither of those two policies passed. This is, you know, very different from, say, the ban the box policy that did pass. Um, we, we didn't discuss yet, but that um, policy, I think, is a great step forward for racial equity. And so we're hoping next year, and there's a large effort forming around this, to have a conversation about restoring the right to vote for people who have served their sentence and are, are reintegrating back into the community. It's a racial equity issue as well. And so look for more work on that next year. And... Um, we're going to um, go to marriage equality. Um, again, this was, as you all know, I'm sure well know, this was something that came from the 2012 ballot. And um, once that was defeated, Minnesotans United morphed into a very, very impressive um, um, lobbying and grassroots engagement effort to actually proactively pass a policy allowing same-sex same couples to marry. And so our hats off to, to Minnesotans United. MCN was uh, a member of that coalition, as were many nonprofits, faith groups, and um, clearly this was one of the, the probably the biggest policy change to come out of the, the session. Um, I did want to note, as, and as we talk about things that remain, one of the, the big priorities that didn't happen was the safe schools legislation that would um, address um, bullying in the schools. So that legislation did not. Um, end up passing, and I know that a lot of the groups that were working on this issue will be um, taking a look at that issue again next session. So I'm going to hand things back to Jeannie here for what happens next. Thank you, Jeff. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to do a quick PSA for nonprofit advocacy, um, having just discussed two items where we saw, as you mentioned, a question on the ballot in 2012, one related to voter ID and one related to same-sex marriage. And um, I, I just want everybody to know that nonprofits are allowed to work on ballot measures and did. All those efforts either for or against those, those uh, measures were done under a nonprofit banner and structure. 
And the IRS actually looks at it as direct lobbying. I know we're used to saying, you know, we can't do anything to influence the outcome of an election. And that's certainly true as it relates to candidates or political parties. But a ballot question is considered issue advocacy. And if it's on the ballot, the voters decide, right? So if nonprofits are trying to engage voters, one way or another on these issues, it's actually considered lobbying and is, is an allowable expense and activity by the IRS. So please call me later if you want to know more specifics on that, but we saw a lot of nonprofit activity around both those issues. So what next? We, um, as I mentioned, we have a two-year cycle for our legislative uh, activities, and we've just completed the first year. So many um, bills that were introduced this year that didn't get a hearing or see the light of day are still viable, uh, still can be discussed next year. We've got a budget in place. Oh, let me ask Christina here, how likely or under what circumstances might we see discussion of some kind of supplemental budget? Well, we'll know better um, when the November forecast comes out later this year. Um, it usually actually comes out the first week of December, but that's when we'll get the next comprehensive look at how our state's revenues and uh, spending is doing, and it's where we'll discover if we have another budget deficit or if we have a positive balance. Remember, if we have a positive balance, that money will go to pay back school districts. Um, and if we have a negative balance, then we will be looking at a supplemental budget um, during the 2014, or we could be looking at a supplemental budget during the 2014 session. Um, but I don't think we'll probably see much of a supplemental budget, but there are still some policy issues that have budget implications that are likely to be discussed during the 2014 session. So, um, but they're not starting up until or February 25th. Yeah. So, um, so we have a little time to prepare. Jeff mentioned the bullying bill. I think some other unfinished business that we might see again is an effort uh, to raise the minimum wage mm -hmm. that went down to the very end, and the House and Senate had different ideas about what that number should be. I think there was general agreement to raise the minimum wage, but that conversation will continue. Uh, remember early on, gun control was a very high profile issue. Uh, that was unresolved. We may or may not see some measures uh, taken up again in that area. With a wide open Secretary of State race, uh, as you I'm sure heard, the current Secretary of State, Mark Ritchie, has decided to not run for re-election after eight years. So my guess is actually we won't see a lot happening on elections or campaign finance reform um, because people will maybe be less bold if they're running for office. I could be wrong. Um, many different ways to stay involved, and I want to pitch a couple uh, events that we have coming up. Our annual conference is occurring in mid-late October this year. We will actually be up in Duluth. So nice time for a little getaway and one night stay in Duluth for all of you who want to join us. And as Christina mentioned, the legislature will go back into session in February. So we already have the Kelly Inn reserved for our annual session lineup, which always takes place the first Friday morning of the legislative session. So please get that on your calendars. Um, Jeff, can we take a minute you mentioned the next webinar is around civic engagement. Can you talk about some of the things people might be hearing from MCN related to local elections this fall? Yeah, absolutely. So our next webinar in July is on uh, working, um, doing civic engagement work and local elections. So uh, clearly looking to a lot of the folks in Minneapolis that may be interested, and I know a lot of folks are already engaging on that. And just like any big election, obviously we get more um, – interest from, you know, we hear more from nonprofits during a presidential election, but um, there are, are clearly decisions, important decisions made at the municipal level. And just like any election, nonprofits can play a really important role in educating voters, um, really educating candidates, uh, registering people to vote. And this is really important because in municipal elections, it really um, can feel like an insider's game and uh, very, can feel very intimidating for some uh, just regular voters to, to engage. And so nonprofits can really play a role in demystifying that um, and, and bringing their issues out uh, on the table and getting those discussed, which is um, a, a fair amount of that's already happening, I know, in Minneapolis, which is wonderful. So please uh, take a look at that webinar. 
And in August, we'll be looking at how to build a grassroots strategy. Um, I think we've uh, reached about our time. If you have any more questions, what I encourage you to do is contact Christina or Jeannie. Their numbers are up there. Um, I'm confident, you know, uh, Christina, Wessel, Nan Madden from the Budget Project, they, they really have a, a very, very impressive handle on the state budget and, and a lot that's going on there. So if you have any questions, if they don't know the answer, that I'm sure they, they would know where to point you. Please use um, the Budget Project as a resource. And we look forward to um, seeing you on future trainings. So I want to thank Jeannie and Christina. And please look for a recording of this webinar, which we'll be posting online. And we hope that you have a, a great summer, that you're preparing for great advocacy next year, and we'd love to stay in touch with you. So thanks for joining, and we'll see you around. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.